Is everybody in the lobby is uh, in? Yes, we don't have anyone waiting at the moment. Well, we have one more. Just oh, we have two more. We'll, we'll keep adding them in. <laughs> OK, perfect. Hello, I'd like to. Uh, so I'll, I'll get us fired off here. I'll get us started. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to what we've uh, what, what is traditionally our public budget. Up. Sorry. Our, our noise on the on the on the phone here. Uh, the fact is. Uh, Thank you. I guess I'll start again. Uh, if everybody could re be reminded to please mute yourselves as you as you come in. Uh, so I do. Uh, I know this is a different format. In in the past, we've been able to kind of go out to the public and go to where the, the people are, be at the wellness center or the museum on the hill or the library or North Crest Arena. Uh, it's been uh, or fire station at the West End. It's been uh, it's it's the the idea behind these has been able to go out to where people are, but for 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 obvious reasons, we're we're not able to kind of uh, go out and uh, have a traditional pop up budget meeting as we uh, as we would like to have because of our because of the of, of the health crisis, which is which has engulfed uh, us these days. Uh, so we have come up with this of this new format. It's not really what people are used to. Uh, the uh, so we've dubbed it the public budget home show rather than the public budget road show so because we want to keep everybody safe and keep them at the, in, as in their homes and but still reach out and have substantial uh, public engagement and uh, I, I know that this is a kind of an odd format for for, for people but uh, we would not be deterred into not doing it this year. We had to find a way forward and a way to uh, reach out to the uh, to the public. So uh, this is this is the format that we've kind of come up with this year. So uh, I wanted to thank start off by thanking staff. I know that uh, Richard, uh, Brendan, uh, Sharon, Sarah, Bill, Yvette. Uh, we have a number of staff here on the call to kind of help us through and assist and uh, hopefully answer any questions that if we have time to answer questions, that's that, that's kind of all of my as a, as a matter of time. And uh, I also want to recognize that Councillor Parnell, Councillor uh, Baldwin and Deputy Mayor Beamer is, is also on the call and joining us for a second week in a row is Councillor Clark as well. Uh, I want to uh, let everybody know that Councillor Real is at a at a Peterborough housing meeting right now, and he'll be joining us uh, when he's done with uh, on, on the housing meeting because housing is a very important issue and it's very near and dear to Councillor uh, Real's heart and Councillor Clark's heart, and so he'll be joining us as soon as that meeting is kind of over. Uh, I'll turn it over to Brendan for some introductory comments from our moderator. Thank you, Councillor Pappas. Uh, as Councillor Pappas mentioned, my name is Brendan Wedley, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's budget roadshow meeting or budget home show meeting this year, inviting you to share comments after the brief presentation from Commissioner of Corporate Services, Richard Freeman, on behalf of the city's finance team. Hopefully the technology works as we all expect today. To start, I'd like to note that this meeting is being recorded so that we can post it online for others to watch when it's convenient for them. Since today is about hearing from the community on community priorities to help set the guidelines for the creation of the draft 2022 budget, we're going to ask that you keep your comments to what you think should be priorities for the city budget. If you have questions on the budget or other city topics, please call us at 705-742-7777, or you can send an email to cityptbo at peterborough.ca for assistance. The focus of this meeting is for the panel of council members and staff to hear from you, to hear from the community on budget priorities. If you're attending online through Teams and you'd like to share an idea, please use the raise hand feature that you should see in the toolbar. And we'll call on people to, to speak, or if you'd like to share an idea, but would prefer not to speak during the meeting, you can type it in the Teams chat feature. We'll be monitoring that chat, thank you. If you're attending by phone, we've asked that phone and participants pre-register to speak since the platform doesn't allow for phone and participants to raise their hand. And we do have several who have registered ahead of the meeting, thank you. We're keeping track of people who have indicated they'd like to speak and we'll let you know when you can unmute to share your ideas or comments on community priorities. When you unmute and that's star six to unmute typically uh, by phone or using the unmute on Teams, 
please remember to introduce yourself before sharing your idea. Please stay muted until you're invited to unmute and you can turn your camera on if you'd like if you'd like to when you're speaking. Otherwise, we ask that you leave your camera off during the meeting. We ask that all participants be kind and be respectful of the ideas and pains of others. For, for participants sharing their ideas, we ask that you keep your comments to two minutes or less so that we can allow others to speak as well. And with that, we'll start with the brief presentation on the budget process. Sure. And I, just, I just did want to remind people that, that it is going to be on YouTube. And so just to be that we are going to broadcast it. So, so, so everybody knows that this will be out on the internet as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. And uh, hopefully you can uh, see my presentation. I'll just try and uh, get it just a little bit bigger here. Brendan, uh, can you see my presentation and hear me okay? We can see it, thank you, Richard. All right, thanks. Thanks everyone, it's good to be with you this evening. The city's 2022 budget process is beginning with these roadshow meetings and the public consultation survey. There are numerous opportunities for public participation in the budget throughout the entire process. After we hear from the public throughout the spring and summer, staff will develop the draft 2022 budget taking into consideration community priorities, legislative program requirements, demands for service and infrastructure, and balancing those wants and needs with the available funding and affordability to taxpayers. In the fall, staff will complete the draft budget. Finance Committee will review and approve the budget guideline in, in June, June and July, and there will be opportunities for the public to have input into that process on the June 23rd public meeting. Finance Committee will deliberate the detailed budget documents in the month of November, um, November 15th and 16th, and then again on the 22nd through to the 25th. And then finally, Council will consider the draft budget for approval on December 13th. This pie chart shows the sources of revenue included in the 2021 budget. Property taxes account for a significant portion of the revenues. And as you can see in 2021, a full 48%. Other sources of revenue include grants from provincial and federal governments, such as federal and provincial gas tax, casino revenues, building permit fees, interest income, development charges, rental fees for the use of city facilities, and so on. This pie chart shows how the draft or how the 2021 operating budget was allocated between city departments and transfers to other organizations. Much of the city spending is for legislative requirements and provincial program delivery and essential services. Property taxes and other revenues in the budget are used to fund operating costs and, and those operating costs include things like heat and electricity, maintenance costs for all city facilities, wages for staff that deliver services and programs like recreation, social services, garbage collection, plowing roads and sidewalks, transit drivers, police and fire. There's a number of uh, departments as well at the city. At the top of the chart at about the 12 o'clock position, we have council in the office of the mayor. The CAO department includes communications, fire services and emergency management. Corporate and legislative services includes the clerk's office, human resources, legal services, financial services, including the tax office and facilities management and planning and infrastructure technology. The infrastructure and planning services department includes engineering construction and public works, waste management, airport, transit, planning and building services. And finally, community services includes social services, arenas and recreation programs, the art gallery, the museum, the library and the marina. The operating budget also includes transfers to external organizations for services provided to various um, to the city residents, including police services, public health, Peterborough Economic Development, Fairhaven, Peterborough County for paramedic services, the Humane Society, and the, and the downtown business improvement area. One item not shown on the, on the pie chart this evening is, is the impact that COVID has had on the city's budget. 
And in um, about February, I guess staff presented a report to to council that indicated that the impact of COVID uh, in our our the financial impact in our community on the city's budget was about twenty one million dollars uh, in twenty twenty, and then already in twenty twenty one at several more million dollars. The good news is in that story, if there is a good news, is that council was able to balance the books without asking the taxpayer for any additional help. Of course, we all know that light is at the end of the tunnel with the vaccinations <laughs> happening in our community. And to help, the city has redeployed staff to help with the vaccine clinics and scheduling of, of appointments. This pie chart shows how the city's 2021 capital budget was allocated between city departments. And you can see from the pie chart at a glance that the lion's share of it goes to the infrastructure and planning services department for, for road and bridge construction, storm and sanitary sewer networks, and for the purchase of major pieces of equipment. At the end of the budget process, staff will produce budget documents that are available online and in paper copy at City Hall. And I just want to take a moment and highlight one of those documents. It's called the Budget in Brief. It's a Coles Notes version of the budget. It's a fairly short document, an easy read, and uses plain everyday language and really helpful if you just want the highlights. That document will be available for pickup at City Hall upon request and online. Also, as part of the, as part of the budget process, we'll be promoting all of the uh, budget documents through our traditional local media channels. I just want to take a moment and highlight some of the information that's uh, online and, uh, and point you to where on the city's website you can find out additional information. So if you go to the city's website and click on City Hall, you can follow the links to the budget page. When the draft 2022 budget is made available in November, the city's uh, web page will be updated with the new information. And there you can find various links that, that can be clicked on, including links that will take you to the actual draft budget documents, the detailed documents and other financial reports. You can find information about the results of the public survey, any public consultation that's taking place. And you can also find out information about where your tax dollars are going, uh, where the city gets this money, and of course, you can find uh, links to all the uh, available detailed documents as well. If you're looking for more specific information on uh, what you pay as a taxpayer for various municipal services, you can go to a page uh, that will pull up a detailed chart that tells you as a residential taxpayer um, what it costs for all the various levels of uh, services. The budget consultation links will provide details of all the community engagement opportunities. They'll provide links to the results of the roadshow uh, meetings or the home show, and uh, as well as a wrap up of all the comments in a report called What We Heard. You can also find uh, a link to, that will take you to the budget page in the online community engagement space called Connect Peterborough. And then finally, I just want to wrap up by showing you something that's relatively new on the city's web page. And it's a new interactive tool, and it's called the Capital Budget Map Viewer. And it shows all the capital projects included in the draft, uh, in the draft budget that will be presented uh, in November, overlaid on a, city's, uh, on a map of the city. And we're looking, of course, at the, uh, the 2021 uh, capital budget here this evening. You can see the projects for each of the city departments and uh, or all of them at once and simply begin by clicking on a, a department and you can see I've selected the infrastructure and planning services department. And when you click on that and and uh, you can see the dark blue areas on the map, they indicate all the capital projects proposed in the draft budget document for that department. You can, when you click on the link or click on the dark blue area, a pop-up window shows the project name and a link to the budget page. And so you can see here this evening, I've selected uh, a project on Lansdowne Street between Park and the Autonomy River. And with that, 
I'll remind you not to uh, forget to complete the budget survey. It's only a couple of days left and uh, and uh, to complete that. And uh, Brendan, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, everyone. Hey, Brendan, I noticed that Councillor Rial is on the call now. I know that he was at the uh, at the P at the PHC meeting, so I don't know if, uh, if Councillor Rial, you want to have a few comments before we you you traditionally have something to say before, before we get started. Yeah. I apologize for being late, but uh, all of us have uh, other duties. So, um, but I, I see there's a um, a lot of people on the call, so I keep my comments short so we can get to the calls and hear what the people have to say. So I want to thank them for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen, Councillor Pappas. And we'll move to the next portion, which is to, to hear from the, the attendees today. I'd just like to uh, to remind people to stay on mute and to, uh, to have your cameras off until you're, you're invited to, to unmute and to share your comment. When people, please use the, the raise hand feature if you'd like to share a comment. And we do have some pre-registered from uh, phone and participants that we'll, we'll call on to unmute as well. For the... Thank you. I'm seeing some people raise their hands, and we'll, we'll put you on the, the list. To start, I'd like to invite, uh, and sorry if I mispronounce your name, Jeff Ricks to, uh, to unmute. Hello. Hello, Hello I can hear me. you. I can hear you. Okay, yeah. I wasn't able to get online, so I'm just call again. Um, Perfect. I got a mix up between the two computers that I was using. Well, that's so good that you're I, here I, now. That's fine. Yeah, so I'm here on the phone. Oh, you go ahead. You've got the floor. So I'm not sure. If, sorry, Councilor Pravis. I'm not sure if that was Mr. Ricks. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. Could, should I start? Please and thank you. OK, sorry for the confusion there. No worries, no worries. So my name is Jeff Ricks. I'm here on behalf of the Peterborough Skateboarding uh, Coalition. We're a continuously growing group of skateboarders and other skate park users, uh, including bikes, scooters, rollerblades, and the like. Um, and we have the goal of improving skateboarding in this city. And our primary focus at this time is working with the city uh, to get a new skate park built. So we have taken a collaborative approach and have already initiated discussions with some members of uh, the RPAC committee there. Um, as the city continues to grow, it's clear to us that has long outgrown the now 20 year old uh, and outdated skate park in Bonnerworth Park. We've noticed a sharp increase in skate park users of all ages since the onset of COVID-19. Uh, and the skate park is currently very busy um, and it's still getting an amazing amount of service hours considering its age and state of deterioration. So with uh, skateboarding entering the 2021 olympics we expect a further increase in demand based on this exposure alone um, and we have qualitative and quantitative studies that inform us of the additional benefits for residents of Peterborough in regards to economic development and tourism health and mental health youth crime reduction uh, and this goes beyond the obvious you know recreational and quality of life benefits that any added park infrastructure would have. Um, so we're asking the city of Peterborough to budget for the creation of a new skate park in 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the, the next presenter, can I invite uh, Graham to unmute and to, uh, to speak to council? Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I prepared three and a half minutes, uh, but I literally just cut a line across my page and that's where I'm going to stop. All right. Um, <clears throat> I looked it up. Climate change mitigation refers to efforts to reduce or prevent emissions of greenhouse gases. Mitigation can mean using new technologies and renewable energy, making older equipment more efficient or changing management practices or consumer behavior. Contrary to what your document says, buying new diesel buses is not climate mitigation. The idea of a fully loaded bus 
and its efficiency is assuming that all the bus riders would or could own a car or have retired a car in place of the bus. This is not likely the case. If it were, the city would be presenting the fuel costs and ridership numbers together so that we citizens can judge this efficiency. Despite the climate change emergency declaration, the city is expanding its capacity to, capacity to expel CO2. The works department plans to buy new combustion fuel machines. The police as well, new diesel buses for transit and subsidies in lieu of pay for city councilors, private cars. <clears throat> on the subject of the police car, I would think that they would want the quietest, quickest cars on the road with the highest safety ratings and lowest annual maintenance costs. This would be an electric car. In absence of that, I would suggest at very least these departments all shut off their vehicles when they are not occupied. If the city were to stop this childish behavior of going to the toilet while leaving the bus running unattended on the curb or leaving multiple cruisers running empty at a crime scene, we would save 15% on fuel at least. That would be an example of climate mitigation. The total number of units of fuel purchased by the city is not easily accessible. I asked Dean Pappas for that number this year and Councillor Clark last year. We have still not come to it. It should be present here as a major expense. After all, that is why we have budget drafts and consultations so that we can all be on the same page as to how you choose to spend our money. I personally would prefer you don't spend it burning oil and gas. Thank you uh, <clears throat> for letting me read off the page. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, I do want to mention that I, I started a petition a while ago. Um, that was the other half of my page, but uh, you know, <clears throat> it is in the interest of reduc uh, reductions of emissions by no longer uh, buying combustion fuel vehicles, which is really the point. We should. Uh, no longer be buying combustion fuel vehicles in order to at least save the money for future investments of things that we know are better than these machines that we uh, continuously buying here. Uh, thanks for the comment, Senator Graham. Graham, thank you right. very much. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Brennan, I, I don't know who's next on the list. Uh, Kathy Shadbolt is next on the list. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. I am a senior. We live on High Street on the side of the hill. In 1980, Lansdowne Place was opened and that led to this street becoming a bit of a nightmare. A country road all of a sudden is the main thoroughfare to the mall. We have no sidewalks. Our driveway here, these eight townhouses, which are occupied, six of them occupied by seniors, we're taking a chance every time we pull out onto the road. And I know that uh, Councillor Parnell is aware of it and Councillor Zippel's been worrying on this. But just recently, our mail delivery was cut off because the post office has decided that this street is too dangerous for the mail deliverer to walk down because of the hill and the traffic and there's no sidewalk. So I read in the paper, I believe yesterday that um, there's a focus on more bike infrastructure and I'm nothing against bikes, but I think we need to have a look at some of these things like sidewalks. Bikes in my experience in this city do not ever stop for people walking, but we, car drivers do and it's time to maybe look at some infrastructure for we people who are expected to walk not only down the hill but back up because when the post office contacted the city the post office said they were going to put the mailbox at the bottom of the hill the general mailbox on Brunswick and then the city said no that's not a good spot because of snow plowing and it's a hill so it got even moved further down to Frank. But what we need, if you're going to have a general mailbox, is something up here at the top of the hill, above the brow of the hill, so that there's a flat space to pull in. And we 
six out of eight seniors here are not expected to walk down the hill and back up. So I hope you give that some consideration. I didn't realize till I checked on when did the uh, Lansdowne place open that it's actually been neglected for 40 years. So we had this young man talking about a 20 year old skate park. This problem is 40 years old. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, and uh, I know that Councillor Parnell did want to answer, but we're asking all councillors to speak at the end of the meeting so that we can get through all of the all of the delegates. So I'm sure she's she's made notes of your comments and we'll address them at the end of the, of the meeting. Brendan. Thank you uh, for participants. You can raise your hand if you'd like to get on the list to to share a comment. Or you can you can type in the chat, and I'll take this opportunity to remind you to uh, that the the survey is available online at connectptbo.ca/2022 budget. The next speaker is Nicola Koyanagi. Sorry if I mispronounced that. It's Koyanagi. Thank you. Hi folks, thanks. It's Nicola Koyanagi. Can you hear me? Yep, you go ahead. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm just calling um, with regards to, I guess the, my first concern is that in the um, online budget survey, um, the the paramedics, was it, sorry, the paramedics, fire service, and policing was all lumped into one category, I believe, under what you described as the chief administrative officer. Um, I'm just hoping that moving forward, these can kind of be degrouped because I feel like it's a little bit misleading. It's not going to give you ac accurate results as to how people feel because I feel like these services are entirely different and ad address different um, means and it doesn't give folks the opportunity to maybe express that policing is actually lower on their priority than the other um, issues such as affordable housing or um, social services um, that work to keep people safe in our community. So that's my my first concern is just hopefully moving forward, we can address those as separate budget categories um, as they are. And I also just want to speak to the, the police budget in general. Um, the police budget, I believe for 2021 was $27 million, um, which is huge. Um, and looking at, you know, a lot of this budget goes towards paying um, officers really large salaries, 100000 plus um, per year. I believe that was 88% of the budget went towards paying salaries. Um, well, at the same time, services such as paramedics only get $5.4 million. Peterborough Public Health, $1.3 million. Um, I hope that that, you know, the budget was reflected differently according to the pandemic. Um, but yeah, when we look at services that work to keep people safe, I feel like the, the police budget is just way far too large. Um, and in addition, also I'm noticing that there's also a $1.5 million capital funding towards the policing on top of their $27 million budget. Um, meanwhile, we're lacking affordable housing in the city. Um, so. Yeah, comparable, the, the $1.5 million capital funding budget is comparable to the $1.2 million that was in the budget for affordable housing initiatives. Um, and it looks like there's a projected 12 million, but I'm really hoping that the councillors um, will be able to invest some of the police budget towards affordable housing, because I think one of the, the biggest issues in Peterborough is a lack of affordable housing. And the reason, you know, that crime rates increase is because of you know lack of job security lack of economic security lack of safe housing um, for people to to keep safe and keep off um, keep out of crime so yeah I, I think that that should be a priority for the city is investing in affordable housing initiatives um, and doing so in a way that will be sustainable and isn't isn't invested in sort of the more uh, I guess profiting the developers, but really what can the city do to invest in that for its citizens? Um, 
yeah, so I think that's that's mostly what I wanted to say. Thank you so much for having me, and I hope that you will, yeah, consider lowering the police budget and also desegregating the the police, fire services, and paramedics um, in your further in inquest. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. We appreciate all, all the input. Um, uh, Brendan? Next would be Mr. Robert Gibson. Hi, um, my name is Wobble. Are you able to hear me? Yep, you go okay. ahead. Yeah, um, so I believe that um, decisions in the city um, should, council should listen to people that are most impacted. Um, by the decision. Um, there are multiple um, multiple areas where the city has not uh, projects, um, and one of them is with uh, change rooms. In, the, in two newspapers, uh, one of the articles I, I wrote, um, there have been five um, Five five, sto five stories directly from transgender people uh, that have experienced um, harassment in um, washrooms, um, and I I believe that it's important to not just listen to um, the loudest or the majority voice, but to listen to. Um, people in, impacted by decisions. And, um, and um, the other thing that I, I would like to uh, highlight is the environment uh, should have higher uh, focus. Um, I believe that daylighting Jackson Creek should be a priority. And um, with the pandemic, it has shown us that um, health, mental health, and um, it is a lot more important and outside um, and for future pandemics, increased biodiversity helps reduce um, the risk of future pandemics, as well as um, flood risk. And I believe that there should be maintenance um, with the with this, and I also believe that clear garbage bags should be looked into to expand the life um, expectancy of the landfill, um, especially when all the uh, surrounding municipalities or most of them are using clear garbage bags, and that, that's what I um, wanted to to say. Thank thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. I do I do as, as appreciate it. Uh, Brennan, who's our next speaker? Thank you, and I just uh, like to thank people who are putting comments in the chat as well. Those those comments will be compiled uh, as uh, when we finish the meeting. Next speaker is Muna. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you. Um, hi, so I, along with Nicola, um, I'm calling in response to the astronomical police budget. Um, I believe that we should be focusing on reallocating re parts of our budget to existing community-led organizations that are able to offer services to more vulnerable communities. Um, as a person of color within this community, I feel that um, police reform or these uses of like adding more costs with community led um community led um like meetings and like other trainings are obviously not working so the idea of divesting the police is something that i think we should definitely be focusing on um in order to show that we understand that for many communities in peterborough police are not protecting or serving our community um that they are negatively impacting a lot of uh, marginalized people whether through um uh over policing or um uh 
ignorance to like how they're acting towards these communities. So um, yeah, that was essentially what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. Brendan. Thank you. The next speaker is Byron. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you to staff and thank you to uh, City Council for uh, having me, uh, having putting this on and having us here. Thank you to Dean Pappas, who also sits on our board. And, um, I uh, agree. I've come here on behalf of the Peterborough Agriculture Society. Uh, most of you know us through our annual event, the Peterborough Exhibition. Uh, typically, we see about 10,000 visitors through the grounds at Mora Park here, um, contributing about $200,000 in direct taxes and about $750,000 in direct consumer spending uh, to Peterborough and the area. Uh, on a broader scale, uh, you know, if you want to see the impact that agriculture has on this community and in this province, um, it's supporting about 158,000 jobs with $8.1 billion in wages and salaries. Um, to that, uh, as, as an agricultural society, I was uh, having a look at the the budget viewer uh, map and I'm to see that uh, there are some improvements to Morrow Park that are planned. Um, I was just looking for some more details on that uh, and um, I'm sure the Agriculture Society will be consulted on it and uh, uh, but I was just looking for some more details on that and to look uh, and for some information in terms of how the twin pad development will be affecting that budget and the overall plans for Morrow Park. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vern. Appreciate it. Thanks, Byron. If uh, you want to send an email to cityptpo at peterborough.ca or to me at bwedley at peterborough.ca, we can we can follow up on those questions. The next speaker is Daniel McLaughlin. Is Danny McLaughlin present? I think I, I, see. I, I see Daniel. I don't I think his cat something blocking his camera as well. I don't know if it's, if it's Daniel. Are you are you muted? Or are you sorry, Danny? I, I see you there. Maybe we can. Maybe he's having some technical problems. Maybe we should go ahead and come back. Okay, we'll do the, ne the next speaker would be Robert Bowers. I invite Robert Bowers to unmute. It's, uh, if you're calling in, it's star six to unmute, likely. One more try. Okay, if you're on, we'll, we'll try to swing back to you uh, next. Keith, could I invite you to unmute? Good evening. I just got a few comments and one that the lady from High Street raised too is the conditions of the sidewalk. You phone the city. Safety is our top priority. And I know this section of the city. I've talked to the public works and I we haven't been here that long, but I'm sure that the one spot has been a damaged sidewalk for 17 years. There's still nothing on the plans to fix it and there's no plans in the future. And there's other spots up in the North Ward after a rain. There's three inches of water on the road. That might be all right for kids to get around or young adults. But you get seniors and mobility issues. How do you get around these spots? You can't go to the other side of the road because there's no sidewalk. You're walking in the traffic. I've raised this many times with councillors and the city works. And the second one is increase the city staff. A minimum wage earner has not got a raise in four years. And some employers don't give you a raise just because you've been there a year. You're still at 14 bucks an hour, the same as you were in 1918, I mean 2018. This is 21, that's four years and no increases. But the city cost of living in the city has gone up 25%. So how is somebody supposed to manage? You give me an answer and I'll tell you. And city sidewalk, sidewalks are terrible. And they've been that way 15 years, because you just look when the last street was redone. There's issues on that street going up Shimong Road at, um, I can't remember just at the dentist anyway, on the west side of the road, the one side over to the 
laneway there, there's handicap accessibles on both sides. On the north one, there's handicap accessibles on Schmong, but there's not on the laneway. So you get somebody with a wheelchair at night, goes across there, they don't know the city, they fall over and they get hurt. Well, that was your responsibility. You didn't see it. But how is a person supposed to see it if they're not familiar with the streets? And it's the same in other parts of the city. One side has got a handicap curb, the other side is a step curb. The only way to get around is go out in the traffic on these main roads. Well, in my opinion, you have province, province bylaw that all streets had to be handicap accessible back before 2010. Here it is 21, and Peterborough is only a quarter of the way there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith. We do appreciate it. Brendan, you have the floor. Thank you. We'll <laughs> see if uh, Robert Bowers has been able to unmute. Star six, if you're on. Hey, Keith, I don't know if you want to mute your camera because you're actually still on. I don't know if you, if you realize that. Oh. Hello, Mr. Bowers. Oh. Hello, is this Mr. Bowers? Uh, it is Robert. Uh, am no. I coming through now? You are, thank you. Okay, uh, I would like to mention uh, a couple of things about uh, taxation and uh, who pays the taxes. And uh, um, I, I know it's all understood uh, according to your uh, calculations, but like uh, the fact is a lot of this money comes from people who don't have it. And uh, we're not doing them right by uh, keeping them on the outside. And uh, we need to close the door and include them. And uh, one of the things that I was thinking of doing was actually uh, having, having help for mental health. And uh, also uh, we need uh, drug abuse uh, control. Uh, we need these, uh, these implemented in the city here. We're really bad off and I know that a lot of people have died over the last year and a half and two years and we know they have. And it's actually worse than, than than code, uh, the illness, uh, our deaths, and uh, we we need to close that door. And uh, these are, are real life people, and we need to be compassionate. So uh, I'm suggesting that uh, we uh, spend some more money on th these people, and also less on on police, uh, uh, because I, I feel the police uh, have enough to do their job. I don't think they need to have an overwhelming amount of money. All right, bye-bye. Thank you very much. We uh, we appreciate your input. Uh, Brendan, I don't know if uh, Dan, if Danny can hear us, but maybe if he can exit team as and come back in, it might help with, with his audio. I know he's having some audio trouble. Thank you. And the, the next speaker is Kevin Duguay. Kevin, I can hear you. Kevin, are you there? Are you able to? Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you, Kevin. Thank you. So I'll start again. Councillor Pappas, other city councillors, staff and members of the community. My name is Kevin Duguay, and uh, I'm a homeowner in the midtown of the city. Uh, one of my, uh, I'm also a planning consultant by profession. One of my observation, Councillor Pappas, is that the planning department is inundated with uh, development applications. I've heard previous speakers talk to things such as affordable housing, uh, skate park, uh, the notion of, for example, Morrow Park, all of these are land use and development related matters. Ultimately, all will have uh, some impact upon uh, the planning department. It's my observation that this city would uh, be well served by, in fact, hiring some additional qualified planners to assist with the unprecedented volume of development and land use approval applications that this city um, is experiencing, and you're not alone. 
all the communities that I deal with throughout Central East, Eastern Ontario are um, experiencing the same phenomena and most are in the position of hiring additional staff to deal with the current workload and the anticipated workload resulting from uh, the realities of current development pressures. And it's not always development folks for the benefit of developers, it's development for the benefit of the community, affordable housing projects and the like. So that would be my uh, one immediate um, um, recommendation. And I would like to thank uh, Mr. Freeman for his opening remarks. And I'd also like to thank the city for the opportunity for one, we get to speak online, speak to council, but also we can review documents. I find the process to be open and transparent. So congratulations in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate all, all as, as all the input, of course. I have, I have Brendan, your background. Thank you. Next up is Richard Abbott. Hi. Um, I'm my input is about housing. I've written a paper that city plans to spend half a million dollars creating a new corporation to manage housing and bypass the um, Peterborough Housing Corporation, which has been doing just an awesome job. This new corporation would take up to a year and a half to incorporate and would greatly delay our ability to apply for federal housing funds. I, I just, and also they'll be creating what's called affordable housing, which is a total misnomer. For affordable housing is 80, 90% of often a $2,000 a month apartment, which no one who needs it can afford. So I'm, I'm saying this should be rethought. We don't need, for the sake of the city controlling housing, we don't need this new entity. Let's stay with the people whose hearts are in it and who are doing such a job. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate all of, of the input, of course. Uh, Brendan, I don't know who's next. Thank you. Ian Average is next. Thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, for for council members and staff um, to uh, to support this. I appreciate the introduction and the opportunity. Um, several things I wanted to highlight today, and I'm hoping that uh, I can provide further detailed notes of this um, over the next day or so. Um, the first item is that I think we need to look at reallocating funds and plan for a post-COVID and a lower carbon future. We need to bring a climate change and social justice lens on analyzing the budget. And I would encourage you to identify these as priorities in the budget um, guideline, not just a financial uh, guideline, but actually one that, that puts priorities in a few key areas, um, discussions amongst uh, council members and with staff looking at the existing plans in order to tease out some of the main areas that can can um, uh, become priorities rather than just simply a, a, a target number on the financial side. Um, and uh, I, I appreciate the remarks of Mr. Duguay uh, a moment ago. Um, I do believe that planning staff is really busy with development applications and uh, that there probably does need to be some further resources for planning staff. I've been asking for this uh, at these budget consultations for the last few years. And I think um, with more staff and support through consultants, if need be, um, we'll be able to get a new official plan. And then the documents that come from that, the strategic planning, the secondary plans, the comprehensive zoning bylaw, and others that need to flow from that official plan in order to take a strategic look on a larger scale than just individual applications. 
Um, when it comes to the transportation plan, we can anticipate uh, that, I guess, may not be fully uh, decided uh, uh, given recent discussions. Um, but um, uh, from Mr. Friedman's uh, presentation and looking at past budget documents, roads tend to be a very expensive item in our capital budget. And I think we need to look at, at trimming that where we can. Um, there has been less wear and tear, uh, less traffic during COVID and with more work at home arrangements. So some of our existing maintenance of roads may be decreased and they may last longer. So trying to reduce some of that budget. I think also um, we need to have more specific and targeted programs for parks and natural areas. This is so often a priority of citizens when they're con you know, contributing to various consultations. Um, the, uh, the Parks and Open Pace study spoke to uh, neighborhood parks, but we need to also look at our regional parks. Um, we have budget items identified for Harper Creek and also for Jackson Creek, um, but uh, I'm not sure that they're moving along. We need to make sure that we start to develop a budget for coming years for other major parks. So we plan them before we start looking at um, new infrastructure or the new developments that may degrade these areas over time. So those are, um, uh, and I appreciate um, when I was on last time, uh, Mr. Freeman was giving an update on uh, the development charges and I, would again ask that um, uh, staff and council consider having um, community member, broader community member participation in the next study on development charges and community benefits. And that um, as part of that to factor in costs, uh, to look at a study of costs and, rev um, and revenues as they vary across the three main growth areas in the city. Um, I think that study will be quite helpful. And that, that concludes my remarks at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. We do appreciate all, all the input. Uh, now, uh, I believe that brings us to the end of our registered uh, delegates. Brendan, is that correct? Or we have, D is Danny McLaughlin still, if he's, is he able to kind of come in? I know he's registered, but he's having technical issues. Yeah, there's no more, no, no more hands raised, Councilor Pappas. Uh, I see that Danny is on. I'm not sure if he's been able to unmute. Danny, can you, are you, Danny, I can, I can see you unmuted if you want to try talking. I think Danny's having technical issues. He may not have a mic on his computer, so that might be the problem at, on, on that end. So, uh, Mr. McLaughlin, hello. if you'd like, hello. oh, there you go. I got you. Oh, hi, finally, there, sorry. There we go. <laughs> It's uh, my first time using Microsoft Teams and had to change the settings. Uh, I'm calling in response today to a couple things. The first is the astronomical police budget, and the second is the uh, increasing concerns around the rise of the anti-lockdown movement. Uh, yesterday, the killer of George Floyd was convicted in what feels like a largely symbolic victory. And since his murder over a year ago, we have really no progress locally in terms of defunding the police and reallocating those resources to things that will actually make our community safe, safer and healthier. Um, now, if you're anything like our police chief, you may think, what does George Floyd have to do with Peterborough and the Canadian police? But we also know that the global movement uh, to defund the police is something that is not simply going to go away and young people especially and people of color are very passionate about this movement. It's not going to go away. And in Canada, it's very relevant specifically to the deaths of people like Ijaz Chaudhry and Regis Korchinski Paquette, as well as a baby who died at the hands of OPP officers in Lindsay just outside of Peterborough. And we don't expect to see any justice served for these individuals the way it was served for George Floyd yesterday. But we can, however, work towards a more equitable society that values social services over the police. 
And policing will not get us out of a pandemic. Policing will not solve the housing crisis. Policing will not help us to fix our inadequate healthcare and education systems uh, that place really no emphasis on mental health or dental health. And, and what we can do, what we, is within our power is defunding the police. And I understand that that phrase makes a lot of people uncomfortable defunding the police, but it doesn't make people uncomfortable when we talk about defunding healthcare or defunding education. And I, I, I don't understand really why that is. And defunding simply means that we're taking those budget lines, like the astronomical police budget and investing it in places that actually make our community safer and better. At the same time, police across Ontario have failed to take action against the anti-lockdown protesters who really are putting out all of our lives in danger by breaking COVID safety measures and perpetuating false ideas that uh, when it comes to public health and safety. And in some cases across Ontario, it is felt that the police are even on the side with the anti-lockdown protesters and they can pick and choose which laws that they would like to enforce. And it seems to me that they like to pick the laws that serve their own their own benefit when it comes to the over policing of of black or indigenous people the police are happy to enforce those laws but when it comes to the policing of what is largely a a, a white movement um they they throw their hands up in the air and they say hey we don't we don't need to enforce enforce the law and i agree i i don't think that the police should interfere with their right to protest but i do feel like it is does create a divide of a two-tier system. And uh, if they're unwilling to do something uh, that is really people putting our health as a community and as a city at risk. Danny, I'm going to need you to kind of wrap up. I gave you a little bit of, of leeway because we're because you had such a hard time. So I gave you a bit of, 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 uh, of leeway there. But if you, if you could wrap up, we'd, uh, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, then, yeah, it, if there's a two-tier system, I just think if they're unwilling to do anything about what is essentially uh, the m major health crisis we are facing right now, then why do we need them? We, and w we don't need to police people. We need to strengthen the institutions that make our community safe and democratic and, and fair and equitable for all. Thank you. We we appreciate it, Dan, and 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 I'm glad you worked through your technical problems to get to, to to be able to get on the call. Uh, are there any? Uh, I think we don't. I don't think we have any other registered delegates. But I'm going to open up the floor to see if there's anybody else who would like to speak who who had called in. I know there's a number of people on this call. So uh, anybody who hasn't already spoken. I know that Danny and Kathy have spoken already. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? I see Bernie in there. She always tells me what to do, but uh, I don't know if there's anybody else who would like to jump in at this point. Okay. See none. There was a. There, we did receive a number of emails, and uh, and I, I promise I would I would ask the questions for. For, for, for some folks, they are directed at some of, of the councillors who are here this evening. Uh, I'll start off with Andrew Beamer. Councillor Beamer, uh, I, I got an email and it's essentially saying if you could take a, f a few minutes to share to, to share your uh, thoughts to ensure that uh, roads remain a priority on the budget. I know that you've often championed that that uh, that, that 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 whole that whole infrastructure part. So, Andrew, would you like to? few minutes to jump in there yeah for sure thank you uh chair uh, pappas um yeah i think roads are uh, a huge priority for for all of us i know uh everyone on the call riel baldwin parnell clark and pappas uh, have uh championed roads around the council table and it's something we hear uh during election so this council really has done a good job on roads we've uh, increased our funding for uh road resurfacing road reconstruction reconstruction and road uh preservation and I think uh, about 40 roads we've reconstructed or repaved 
um, between 2019 and in 2021 this spring. So that's quite an accomplishment. And uh, certainly driving around the city, I think you see a, a lot of roads <clears throat> resurfaced or uh, re, uh, repaved. So it's uh, certainly a priority for this council. Uh, we've increased the uh, budgeting significantly and it will uh, it will remain a, a focus of this council. So, uh, so thanks for the question and uh, certainly it will remain a priority. Thanks, Dean. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, the next one is for Councillor Baldwin. Uh, Gary, I'm just going to sum summarize it because I don't want to read out the whole email, but it's basically, could you take a, f a few moments to share uh, to share an update on the proposed new location at Morrill Park for the uh, Twin Pad? I know we had the Agricultural Society here today was asking kind of the same question, and I know that arenas have been part of your kind of passion. So if you want to jump on that. Yeah, thanks very much, Councillor Pappas. And, um, you know, I think uh, the potential project we've got will be a generational project that the community can be proud of. Uh, it's been over 20 years since the uh, the building of the Evanroot Centre. And since that time, we have, we've had the decommissioning of, of Northcrest Arena. So, you know, having uh, traveled around most of the province and been in many of the arenas, you know, I think we have a, a pretty good handle on what the requests are from people. We've had two iterations of uh, a new uh, proposed complex. One we started at Trent University, and then we took some of those concepts and we were going to apply those to Sir Sanford Fleming. Um, however, we uh, November last November, council made a decision to look at uh, Morrill Park as the preferred site. So. Um, that's where we're going next. We, uh, I know there's some work underway with respect to developing a, a high level uh, conceptual design and the budget required for that. Um, certainly developmental charges will pay for some of the arena, but uh, to get the type of facility, a uh, minimum twin pad and aquatic center, we're going to need the other levels of government to come to the table. Uh, so, um, you know, if you're listing uh, MPP uh, Smith and MP Mary Monsef, we certainly will need you uh, at the appropriate time. Uh, there will be a, a, a survey coming out, a community survey um, feedback. Um, I would encourage people who um, want to have input to please fill out the survey uh, so that staff can have a look at that and council can have a look at the, the amenities that are going to be uh, occurring. And there's going to be an interactive opportunity for people just like we're doing tonight on, on Teams to be able to to speak about this. I believe that's Wednesday, April the 28th. Uh, there should be a link there um, uh, on the city website. So I would encourage people uh, again to come and speak uh, to the members of, of us who will be on that call and staff, express the, 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 pipe, the type of amenities that you'd like to see and um, you know, give us give us your input. So we're we're at the uh, the communication and consultation stage. Uh, members of council are certainly uh, open to your suggestions and your and your wants, and we look forward to hearing uh, about that going forward. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Baldwin. Uh, lastly, we have one for Councilor Parnell, who's the chair of Arenas, Parks and Rec. Uh, Councilor Parnell, basically says that the between with with the pandemic the use of our open spaces in our parks has increased and uh and she and they're just wondering if you take a few minutes to kind of share how how the city's planning on supporting the uh the splash pads and park maintenance in this year's budget if you want to talk about that a little bit thank you certainly uh well thank you for the question and definitely i don't I mean, we in Peterborough have absolutely treasured our parks and open spaces and trails and even sidewalks uh, so much that, and it's even been highlighted more uh, during the, the whole pandemic. And, and uh, we saw the reaction over the weekend when the premier said that he was going to shut playgrounds and so many people thought he was shutting down parks and there was just an explosion around the province uh, on how people really value uh, these types of spaces and, uh, and it is definitely a priority uh, for me. I know for everybody on this call um, and we have to continue to provide more and more recreational opportunities in the space we have uh, because our city is growing and um, our citizens are active and they want to be more active. They want to be healthy. 
Uh, so one of our one piece of this um, is uh, replacing wading pools with splash pads and the very good reasons for doing that. Uh, less water is used with uh, splash pads versus filling up a wading pool and emptying it every single day. Uh, plus, we, we don't have to have a lifeguard there. So it's much more accessible to people. Um, so we have over 10 years. Uh, been replacing our wading pools and we're still going to be adding more splash pads when we're done. <clears throat> what Council has approved for uh, this coming year, well actually this summer, this is happening. Um, so up at, um, excuse me, uh, Hamilton Park um, in Town Ward, right, is being done with the splash pads. So there's $200,000 allocated to that. And there's a survey on connectptbo.ca about that right now. So I would encourage people to go to connectptbo.ca. Everything's there. It's an incredible communication tool. And um, so go there and fill out every survey that applies to you. Um, also, at the same time, we're going to be doing Turner Park. So that's one where we're removing a wading pool and putting in a splash pad. And we've allocated $320,000 for that one. And of course, last year, uh, we did um, the Bernardo Park wading pool. And we are just starting, like literally last night, <laughs> just starting the process of looking for a West End park uh, that would be suitable for another splash pad in 2023-24. So these things do take time and you know we do start them as early as we can to you know get as much consultation and have the best result um, at the end of it when we actually start to build. Um, so those are some of the things. Um, also we do have over two million dollars a year uh, that our public works department puts into our park maintenance. Over 100 parks in Pebro we look after, over 36 kilometers of, of uh, trails plus all of our sidewalks. So it is a lot of work to do and trees of course, everybody loves trees. I'm a tree hugger, <laughs> happy to admit it. Um, so $400,000 in new trees. Uh, plus we have some donations of trees coming, uh, 600 trees. Uh, so that's, all very important for the parks and you know please you know, keep in touch with us um, if you want to get involved in tree planting yourself you know cooperate with or you know contact green up uh, many partnership opportunities uh, through that as well thank you uh, uh i have a couple more here that i'm going to try and squeeze in before you run out of time and Perhaps staff can kind of jump in on, but the the, the next one is, how does the city uh, prioritize projects on the capital budget uh, as, as we go forward? That's essentially what it says. How do you pick which roads are done, which capital projects? But it's essentially asking, uh, th this guy wants to know kind of how, how we model our capital funding. So uh, it's a bit of a technical question. So I'm going to ask Mr. F Mr. Freeman to kind of jump in on that one. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Pappas. And um, each year, the the budget team actually prepares what we call a capital funding model. And um, what we do is we is we estimate all of the different financing that's available, and we provide that to uh, in senior managers and and those who prepare the budget documents. And of course, those uh, those individuals then use their their expertise. And um, and the the condition of the assets and the health and safety considerations and all the various legislative requirements and so on, um, in preparing uh, you know the current year budget, we then also have a, a bit of a prioritization matrix um, that asks a number of questions that that considers the overall benefit and the cost impacts uh, for the projects in the community. And um, and then at the end of the kind of the staff process, um, we meet as, as senior management and discuss all of the projects that are uh, in the draft budget document, and we ensure that we we have met the the funding uh, envelopes that council has provided, and uh, and then we then we make that presentation to council, and then and and we let council take it from there, and they make the final determination. So. That gives you a bit of an inside picture of of how we uh, how we make the determination of what gets included in the draft the draft budget document. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. And uh, I don't know who wanted to answer our next one here with the North End Fire Station uh, picked. Uh, what's the timeline for it to be to be built? 
and which subdivisions is it going to serve service? I guess it's going to service all of them, but uh, Mr. Freeman, or I don't know if you or Bill or somebody knows, uh, or, or, or Councillor Beamer who knows what, what's our timeline on the build on that. Well, I can I can certainly jump in, Councillor Pappas, and others can sure. supplement my answer. Um, and and the question is kind of timely because there's a report actually in front of council um, in the in this April cycle of meetings and and if council actually approves the the report on uh, this coming Monday night, I believe at at the council meeting, that would provide the uh, the the funds necessary to move that project forward, and and I would expect and anticipate that the start of construction for the new fire station would probably be in the spring of 2022. Um, Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, there's more, and I, I apologize to people who I didn't get their questions asked. We'll try to get staff to email them back to, to roughly with some of the answers because we're, we're kind of running out of time. I did want to ask Councillor Clark if he had anything to add to, to tonight's meeting. Councillor Pappas, thank you very much. I just want to thank all the people who have taken the time to share their ideas. I know I made some notes during the discussions, heard some uh, very key issues. It does help us when we know what's on people's minds. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the input. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to give Councillor Riel a word here and then we'll kind of wrap it up. Um, certainly. Um, thank you very much, Councillor Pappas. Certainly, I want to thank everybody that uh, took part see, tonight. This is one of our biggest um, virtual roadshows that we've had, or as you call it, is is it in, in at home? Or at home show. At home, home show. show. Um, and um, like Councillor Clark says, we um, um, we listen as councillors. Um, this is your budget; it's just not ours. We have decisions to make as council, but certainly everything that was said tonight. Um, everybody was taking notes, everybody was listening. So certainly when we get into the debate part of the budget, um, certainly I think things will resonate with us, what people have said tonight and what their priorities are as opposed to us. So um, this has been a, um, we've had three of these meetings. We wanna thank everybody that's taken part. We got off kind of a slow start, but tonight was a great night. We had all kinds of people um, that uh, took the time out of their, li their uh, busy lives to to share with us and what their thoughts were on the budget process. So I want to thank them. I want to thank staff uh, and all the help that they've given uh, both Councillor Pappas and us, myself as uh, chair and co-chair of um, of uh, the budget and the finance, um, the help that we needed to put these on. So uh, I want to thank all of um, senior staff and staff for helping us out. Thanks, Keith. Uh, I see. Did, 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 did you have something to add? <coughs> really brief. <laughs> Very brief. Yes, I did. Um, I did want to um, answer Kathy's question earlier. One of the earlier speakers oh, yeah. about High Street, um, and she's absolutely right. High Street is. Um, a very difficult problem that we have to deal with somehow. Uh, our challenges are that we don't have the usual road allowance there. It's a very narrow street. Uh, we don't have enough land for sidewalks unless we take a bunch of houses. <laughs> um, so, but the good news is that uh, with this traffic calming program that we started this calendar year, we are going to be looking at High Street next on how we can deal with the you know, deal with the, the conditions of that road. Um, you know, will it be one way or not? Uh, will we try to put a sidewalk in on one side or not? Uh, we have to have a serious look at it, get community input. Um, so watch for that coming forward. Uh, there will be a press release when we start that process and everybody in that area will receive a direct invitation to participate. Um, and yes, uh, go please go, uh, I mentioned it before, but go to connectptvo.ca. Uh, Councillor Baldwin aptly talk about our our Twin Pad and Aquatic Centre. That survey is already up um, as of today on connectptbo.ca. So uh, Vern, please you know have a look at it. We'll definitely make sure that the Agriculture Society gets to put their input in as everybody. So now we actually have a bit of a drawing of where it's going to be in Morrow Park, how it'll all fit. And then of course we want to know what people want inside the building. So thank, thank you, you Mr. Leslie. Chair. Appreciate it. And if there's anybody else before I get the final word in here. Going once, going twice. I too would like to thank everybody. I know uh, 
Uh, last year, I dragged Kelser Baldwin around to every hockey arena and uh, sports facility for the road show. And uh, I know he, I, I know he's very involved as well. So I want to thank you for your for, for, for your support in the past. And Councillor as, as Beamer has been a stalwart on all the budget issues. He's he, he's always been right there. And Councillor Parnell, we just heard, is such an advocate for her ward and her ward issues. So we appreciate. That is too, and Councillor Clark. We know your love of, of housing, and uh, how you're how you're trying to help people, and housing is fundamental. And my friend Councillor Riel, uh, we've been through a lot this year already, and a lot over the years. And I know uh, this man knows more about social services than anybody I've ever served with on council. So he has a big heart, and uh, and he really knows his stuff. So we do we, we do appreciate you on, on, on council as well. And again, I'd like to thank everybody, all of the staff involved here tonight. Uh, Mr. Freeman, all of the finance staff, uh, Sharon and uh, Brendan and Sarah and all of the all the community, all the communication staff who have made these meetings possible. We really do appreciate it. Uh, we probably couldn't do it with, without your uh, with, 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 without you and, and, and uh, helping us through this. And most of all, I'd like to thank all of the public because this really is the public's budget. It's the public's tax dollars. Uh, it's the public's community. How they want to see it uh, built and developed is all about the budget. If the money's not there, we can't do anything. So it's all about the budget. And I encourage everybody to please uh, fill out the public budget survey. There's a, there's a few days left and uh, our numbers are going up. Uh, but the more the more people that can participate in the budget, the more accurate our kind of forecasts are out of that budget. So please log on and fill out the public budget survey. We are we are trying to evolve our public engagement every year. It just changes. This is our third year of doing this, so every year it kind of evolves and it moves forward. So I'd like to thank all of the public as immensely because it is their city, their budget. And their kind of tax dollars, who, uh, who, which we're spending here. So, thanks everybody. Stay safe. Thanks, Dean. Good job. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. <laughs> <laughs>